ಭಗವತು ಅರ್ಹತು ಸಂಬುಂದಸ ಬುಂದಂ ಶರಣ ಗಚ್ಛಾಮಿ ಧಮ್ಮಂ ಶರಣ ಗಚ್ಛಾಮಿ ಸಂಗಂ ಶರಣ ಗಚ್ಛಾಮಿ ದ್ವಿತೀಯಂಪಿ ಬುಂದಂ ಶರಣ ಗಚ್ಛಾಮಿ ದ್ವಿತೀಯಂಪಿ ಧಮ್ಮಂ ಶರಣ ಗಚ್ಛಾಮಿ ದ್ವಿತೀಯಂಪಿ ಸಂಗಂ ಶರಣ ಗಚ್ಛಾಮಿ ತೃತೀಯಂಪಿ ಬುಂದಂ ಶರಣ ಗಚ್ಛಾಮಿ ತೃತೀಯಂಪಿ ಧಮ್ಮಂ ಶರಣ ಗಚ್ಛಾಮಿ ತೃತೀಯಂಪಿ ಸಂಗಂ ಶರಣ ಗಚ್ಛಾಮಿ So welcome friends uh, to this uh, Sunday afternoon. Uh, questions and answers uh, session and uh, guided meditation. Uh so from last week uh, we had uh, uh, one question that uh, I didn't uh, get around to answering. So uh, I'm going to uh, answer uh, as that uh, and try to answer that question now is from uh I don't know if the person who wrote that question uh, Kim and so it was about uh, the question was uh, how do we know when we have gotten a good concentration and <clears throat> so I wanted to talk about the uh, concentration uh, a little bit to kind of just to to start uh, you know the, the session and see if some more questions might come out of that also so ba- basically there are three levels to concentration uh one is called the excess concentration and another is called momentary concentration and one is called absorption concentration uh normally our mind has the five hindrances and it's usually being assailed uh and uh you know distracted by these uh, hindrances as you all well know uh that means drowsiness sloth and torpor uh sense of desire and thinking about things you, you want or pleasant things and ill will sort of the opposite remembering uh, things that uh, bothered you or certain types of people uh then there's this restlessness and worry just the mind can't settle down just jumping around uh, here and there kind of most of that's based on either just not getting what you want getting what you don't want uh, uh worry uh, doubts uh, well and doubts is another thing is anyway so uh that's your ordinary person's uh, state of mind very distracted and when they whenever they hear or feel something they immediately react to it you know rubbing this or want to look at this and that and uh so in excess concentration you you know whether you're using your uh, preliminary object which is usually like mindfulness of breathing or you could uh the cultivating metta which is a kind of a thought process but still that's a kind of concentration that means you are limiting your thinking to a particular dhamma uh, topic so that's also uh, concentration if something is interesting you uh, you will stay focused on that uh, train of thought and not be the other hindrances won't come in so much and then there's the you know like the anapanasati the breathing awareness where you you don't particularly try to think but you you you're remembering about breathing so you're remembering breathing in you're remembering breathing out you're trying to feel that the sensation of that so your focus is also becomes a, a limited or try to limit it to that remembering and feeling uh 
you know, the present moment process of breathing, or it could be the sitting posture too. I also encourage people, recommend people using the sitting posture. And within that, there are many different types of sensations going on, different sensations you can feel, but it's still concentrated. That means it's with staying within the, uh, the body. And there's more things interesting to feel, so it can be uh, a little bit more, uh, you know, interesting for the mind than just trying to stay uh, pinpoint focused on uh, something just like the, the sensation of breathing. Anyway, so uh, access concentration is mean when those neurotic thoughts calm down uh, and uh, and you start feeling more comfortable, less less random thoughts. You still have thoughts coming and going, but you don't get locked into them so easily. Uh, your mindfulness is able to, to note them uh, before you spend a whole lot of time getting lost in them. You can easily let them go. You can come back to your posture or breathing. So little by little, uh, you, your attention is able to stay with the breathing longer than being lost in thoughts. Uh, you could say you know, if you reach that 50% level where at least 50% of the time you're, you're feeling, you're breathing, or you're on your meditation subject, 50% of your time uh, may be distracted by hindrances. Still, that's quite a, a goal for a, a lot of people. Uh, so you can say that that's a, a good start, a signpost for the meditation. Anyway, uh, that's if you're practicing samatha meditation where you try to keep your attention uh, limited to either that touch of air, the breathing, or uh, the sensations uh, uh, of different sensations of breathing or the posture or, for example, uh, cultivating metta. Uh, and you don't deliberately try to think about other things. <clears throat> uh, so when you gain that, uh, that access concentration or that, uh, you know, you feel more grounded and centered also. And what, like little scratches and itches and other little body irritations that you might have wanted to rub or itch or scratch or move your posture because of some pain. The urges to do that don't, uh, uh, are not so strong. So you're able to endure, let's say, pains longer or being able to just watch and itch as it kind of builds up and fades away and, and disappears. Uh, so the ability to kind of watch things uh, uh, as they come and go. And so that's actually the beginning of momentary concentration. So by in the beginning of the practice, when you you know you uh, limit your concentration to let's say just the breathing as we normally do, uh, as we'll do again today, but they limit it to the the breathing or the posture. By doing that, the hindrance is weakened and the mind becomes more clear. Then that's when you can easily start practicing the momentary concentration. That means you whatever starts to take your attention, you just momentarily uh, note it or observe it. And usually it uh, vanishes or just passes away and you, and you note something else. Because there's always something you can notice coming through the senses. There's always many body sensations you, you could feel or all, again, the random thoughts, sounds, if you're in a place where there's lots of sounds and you just kind of open up and you just uh, be aware of how quickly different sensations and sounds or thoughts or urges come and go. As you're not reacting to them, those things uh, very quickly vanish and you're open to know. The more things that are there to notice, less time to the mind to cling on to one particular one. And so uh, they, they more easily, uh, you know, vanish out of the mind. Uh, <clears throat> and you're starting to enjoy meditation. For a lot of people, you know, meditation is a burden and they're wondering what time is it going to be over and 
and uh, or they you know they think they're not making progress or they're you know disappointed in that but you know when you start to gain concentration it becomes very really, uh, interesting and that's what's called the the the, the pt the interest uh, the mind gets interested in it, in what it's doing because it's noticing that something is happening there uh, and then of course there's the there's the absorption concentration uh, which is where all the wandering thoughts have subsided and the mind has developed applied and sustained thought. That means uh, whatever the object is, whether it's the breathing, the posture, or the thought of metta, or the, the mind is no longer, the hindrances have uh, subsided and the mind is uh, more or less fully uh, kind of just at one with that particular uh, uh, you know, focus. So anyway, uh, that's when, how you judge your progress in meditation or when you have good concentration, especially the volume of thoughts is not so much and you feel more comfortable, you, you have an equanimity. So especially as you gain a deeper concentration, uh, you no longer you no longer want to move. You know it's easy to sit for a longer period of time, and sure there'll still be pains and itches and things, but the the mind will no longer be really worrying about them too much. It, it can it can rest in the present moment in spite of those other things. Or there might be loud noises going on outside, but it's like there's an invisible shield has been built around the, the body and mind. Uh, and these things to kind of just bounce off. You can hear them and feel them, but it is like, you know, they're not penetrating the nervous system. So that's a sign of concentration too. And, and that is when you can effectively practice the Vipassana meditation. Rather than getting lost into the, the quietness and feel good feeling of the, of the Samatha, in, which, you, which is easy to do, you r remain alert and that's when you uh, start developing the momentary concentration to practice vipassana. And this is where I wanted to actually talk about the similes of the five aggregates. Uh, and the, you know, the five aggregates are the focus of vipassana meditation. So once you've gotten that initial concentration and uh, you can start, you know, you know, the mind is clear enough to notice things coming and going. That's the time to, uh, to open up to the flow of impermanence and the, and the five aggregates especially. So the Buddha gave some very nice similes that I just want to remind you of, of the form, feeling, perception, volition, and consciousness. So these are called the five aggregates that make up our body-mind process. And this is the object of the Vipassana meditation. In fact, that's the meaning of Vipassana. Uh, seeing things, seeing the body-mind process broken into its parts of form, feeling, perception, volition, and consciousness. Uh, so the material form, the Buddha said to, to investigate material form, that it's like a, a, a foam floating on the water. So you've been to a lake or a river where you see some white foamy stuff along the banks and, and so on. So if you, you know, it might look solid from a distance when you go up and you, you get a stick and you poke it in there, you can scatter that foam because it has no really any solid core. So material forms that, uh, of this body of, of the world, their essence is basically no more solid than a that kind of foam. It's only our mind makes it feel solid, our clinging and, and so on. And then feelings should be observed like water bubbles. You know how a water bubble comes up from the bottom of a lake and then bursts on the surface. Uh, or, you know, those soap bubbles when you were a young kid, right? You blow the soap bubbles and, you know, it looks nice, has some color, but it, it after five or 10 seconds, it bursts and there's nothing. So in the same way, our feelings, the pleasant feeling, painful feelings, which are created largely by the mind, uh, they don't have any more 
actual substance than a water bubble. And it's only our attachment and clinging to the feeling that makes them appear to be something that's real and, and affecting us. And then the perceptions, that means the mental images. Uh, perceptions, the easiest way to understand perception is, you know, if you're looking at the screen and you're identifying the image on the screen as Bhante Rahula talking, that's a perception. Otherwise, it's just a color in a certain shape on your screen. There's no meaning to anybody who doesn't know that. Uh, or any of the other objects that you might see, a uh, lion there or the, the statue or, or whatever. Uh, when the mind, it's the names and labels, it's come from memory really, you know, uh, the perception. Even when you hear a sound, you hear, uh, you know, a car going, you know, a car going down the street, then you think, oh, cars going down the street or you know it's a car going down. So that's a perception. And these are like a mirage. So the Buddha had us uh, regard uh, perceptions like a mirage. It's like on a desert when you think there's water out there on the horizon, you start walking toward it, but you never get, <laughs> get there because it, it's, you know, it's changing. So our perceptions are always uh, changing moment by moment as well arising and and vanishing. And because they're just produced by the mind, like a like a the frames of a motion picture, a reel of film film rolling along, and each one just is arising and vanishing. Creating the illusion that there's a solid uh, movie running there and all that, but actually they're just, you know, frames uh, coming and going one by itself doesn't mean much. And then the mental activity, our urges, desires, our thoughts, our emotions, and so on, these are, these are said to be like the em empty, hollow core of a banana tree. You ever know what a banana, ever chopped down a banana tree, or you can imagine, it's just made up of many layers of, you know, cellulose kind of material that when you peel it all off, or like an onion, you keep peeling off the, the there's sheaves of the onion or banana, and you get to the middle, there's no solid core. So the same way, to all of our thoughts and so on, they're just the thought bubbles. They don't have any solid core to them, you know. You strip them all down, you, you realize they're made up of just illusions. Uh, and then consciousness itself. Uh, and usually when I describe consciousness, it means with the sense of self, the I with it. Uh, but it's basically hearing, seeing, tasting, smelling, touching, and thinking. But it's the same really as perception because perception and consciousness are very close together. Uh, because whatever you perceive, you're conscious of that and you can only be conscious of a perception, really. Uh, So uh, like that, uh, that is said to be, especially about the sense of self and I. It's like uh, a magician's trick, a magical illusion, magicians. So the magician pulls a rabbit out of the hat. <laughs> so we're pulling an eye out of the hat of just hearing, seeing, tasting, smelling, touching, and thinking. We're trying to pull an eye or a me out of that. But there's no real rabbit in it. There's no real I in that. It's something we cleverly, is cleverly a trick. The consciousness is tricking us into believing because consciousness ex needs the I to continue its search for pleasure and, uh, and so on, Conti continue life. Really. Anyway, just very briefly, I just wanted to uh, remind yourself of those uh, little similes because you know when you're meditating this is this is what you can think about i mean the five aggregates can be an applied and sustained thought it can be a topic of investigation you can you can you reach access concentration in uh, just you know thinking about the five aggregates or one of them or or multiple of of them you know as 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 they're predominantly arising in your mind you understand ah this is form this is feeling, this is perception. 
This is volition. This is consciousness, especially when you're getting attached to it. You see the mind clinging to uh, one of these. Then you can apply that simile and see how that you know, uh, works. Okay, so uh, now uh, I want to, you know, again, uh, open it up for questions. So I see that uh, some people have already written on the chat some more questions. So uh, let's uh, take a look at uh, that. In walking meditation, it is not possible to get into a state of samadhi, correct? Uh, yes and no. Uh, depending on what your definition of samadhi is. I just talked about there's three levels of samadhi. Access samadhi, what's called upachara samadhi. Then there's uh, kanika samadhi, momentary concentration. And there's uh, upachara uh, I mean, there's a apana uh, samadhi or the, the full concentration. So uh, you can, if you're following each moment of lifting, swinging, placing of the feet in each moment of, uh, you know, the different sensations in the body and the mind is not distracted by other things, uh, you can reach this uh, state of kanaka samadhi. Uh, or even access concentration. Now, it would be kind of hard to uh, continue walking and doing activity in the full state of absorption. So I would say probably if you're in the full jhana, then you uh, probably uh, wouldn't want to be doing the walking because there's too much other activity involved in, in the walking. But uh, in the other levels, the lesser levels of uh, the concentration, you could practice walking meditation, movement meditation, especially the momentary uh, concentration. And, you know, you can get into a state where, you know, you're observing the body walking in a minute, minute details, and it's almost like you're not in the body, you're just walk, watching this body walking, and kind of, you know, but just seeing this minute process, and, and the sense of I gets detached from it, and and it becomes very, very uh, interesting. Uh, it becomes very, you could say, psychedelic uh, when you reach those states uh, of where you're seeing things like you're actually watching a motion picture in slow motion. Uh, and people have, uh, you know, people who've had near-death experiences, you know, and like had some you know, car crash or some other times where, you know, the last few seconds before they died, they, they saw everything in slow motion. Well, that can happen in meditation also. And that's a state of samadhi. Um, because normally there's a, no uh, thought activity really going on in those states. It's just, uh, but anyway, there's a lot of interesting uh, states you can get into. Um, so people who have uh, difficulty sitting whether it's because of boredom or you get lost in your thoughts. And walking is, uh, you know, a, a powerful practice. It's a powerful alternative, both standing and walking, because it takes more activity uh, to, to walk. But at the same time, if you know how to keep the mind uh, focused in that, you can get quite concentrated. And then when the mind is calmed down to that, then go and sit down and see if you can then more easily uh, get into the sitting meditation. Well, this next question. Uh, while doing the meditation, we could observe body sensations. How can we see the five aggregates? It's easy to see the feelings of the breath and the thoughts. How do I identify perceptions in consciousness? Uh, well, uh, the perceptions, anytime you think of the body, if you say, that's my foot, that's a perception. If you say my breath, that's a perception. I'm, as I just finished the saying, perception is the name or label of any word, 
any word that comes into your mind is a perception because it's usually related to something. You know, you, you feel something on your body and say, that's my arm, that's my leg, that's my eye. Uh, that's a pain, that's a perception. That means the mind is identified with something. But it usually comes with a label because of the language. We've learned what everything means, basically. You know, So that's a perception. It happens all the time. It's probably the easiest thing, actually, to identify. Uh, and myself is a perception of consciousness. You know, perception and consciousness, as I mentioned, are basically identical. You can't have one without the other. So when you're conscious, that's a perception. Because you're perceiving something. You're conscious of something. A sound, smell, taste, touch, thought, feeling. Uh, yeah, so it's not really that difficult. Don't, don't make it uh, too difficult. You know, people try to make the, this meditation more difficult. Uh, it's, it's not that difficult. It's the hindrances, of course, that make it that difficult. But uh, so it's easy to see the feelings of the breath. Well, f feel where your buttocks are pressing the, f the seat. That's easier than the breath. Or where your feet touch the floor. That's easier than the breath. Actually, it's easier than watching the breath. Just feel the sensations of the, you know, you got a hundred pounds pressing your buttocks on the, on the seat. That's a lot of weight going down there. That earth vibration. Or where your hands touch together, your feet touch together, even the clothing touching your skin. All of that is, uh, you know, awareness of sensation. It's a lot easier to watch than the breath. And there's more of them. So you can really, you know, you can see a lot of more sensations than just the, the breath. But as I mentioned, uh, one should first calm the mind down and get focused with the breathing. And then when you start feeling so many other different body sensations, the mind will, will not be uh, distracted by it. And it's like looking through a microscope. You can see all these things, like a scientist looking that all these blood vessels and cells moving around, right? Like that, that's what we're looking at inside of our body, all the different sensations. We focus it like we're looking through a microscope. Uh, and so how can we see the five aggregates? They're always there. You, you cannot not see them, actually. You cannot not see them. You just don't know what they are, but they're there. You know, again, just, that is form, the feeling of your buttocks pressing the seat. That's form, earth, earth vibration, earth element. Or if you feel saliva in the mouth, water vibration. If you feel heat in the body, fire element. Uh, or if you hear a sound, that's also material form, form aggregate. You know, car going down the road. Uh, and then what kind of a feeling does it arouse, arise in you? Pleasant, painful, neutral feeling. That's the feeling. And the perception, you identify it. The per they're all there together. It's like a soup. If you have a soup, and it's got, uh, let's say, five different flavors in, in the soup. The salt, pepper, cinnamon, whatever, whatever, you know, chili powder. Uh, you can't separate out all those uh, flavors individually, right, normally. But you can say, you, oh, this has cinnamon. Oh, this has got pepper in it. It's got salt in it. So the same way in each moment, all those aggregates really are there in each conscious moment. And uh, once you get familiar with them, you will be more and more easily to identify. And then you get very concentrated. It becomes, it becomes, it becomes very interesting to observe that. And you get detachment to it. And you can just observe these things from a a detached uh, perspective, not being worried about, oh, that's just anger. So what? It's just an anger bubble. Or it's just a sadness bubble. Not, oh, I am sad. That person didn't, you know, you get all involved in your emotions. That's because there's no samadhi. You know, the, uh, but wh when you develop the concentration, you don't get sucked into things like that. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, that's, that's when you know you, you, you've gotten a good state of meditation when you're able to observe all those things. Uh, 
uh, without you know being affected by them. And uh, how to identify the consciousness that I mentioned? Whenever you have the thought of yourself, I am meditating. Well, okay, that's that's ego consciousness, right? Or your consciousness is always there, unless you're sleeping or unconscious. Consciousness is always there, uh, but it's it's not so easy to identify it as a perception that just uh, arises and vanishes very quickly because we we cling to the consciousness more tightly than let's say the form feeling perception so this is all part of the investigation this is what you investigate you know this is what you observe in meditation in vipassana meditation mindfulness uh, Next question, how are we supposed to contemplate the subject of our meditation when the subject is not our breath or physical body? At what point in our practice is it wise to meditate on particular subjects versus the body or breath? Well, it's a metta meditation, right? So that's a very popular form of meditation. It is not connected necessarily to your breathing or the body. So you just develop this uh, thought that may I be well and happy and my parents, family members, gradually uh, de uh, developing this, uh, these thoughts of metta towards uh, uh, oneself and then gradually expanding it uh, outward and wishing that you know, all beings could be free from suffering and uh, so on. So you know that, that that's a, a valid form of uh, you know of developing to the first jhana. You can uh, you know even the, even the first, second, third, or fourth jhana you can get into by practicing uh, metta. But because uh, the you know the body and breathing are what uh, the subjects are going to take you deeper into non-verbal type of awareness, and uh, and also it's the, the subject of the uh, Vipassana meditation also. So by developing shamatha on the posture and the breathing, when you reach the shamatha, you're already there instantly practicing the Vipassana because that's where the whole world comes and goes through this breathing body uh, nervous system. And so you have a front row seat, balcony seat, right? Uh, to watch the the five aggregates trip out from this state of detachment. Ah, the aggregates are there, but only for developing knowledge and deepening knowledge and in in awareness. Um. <coughs> <coughs> Or you, you, you could, you know, there's lots of uh, actually me types of meditation, reflections that one can meditate on, like the loathsomeness of food or uh, the, you know, impermanence. Uh, uh, and then the, you know, the Brahma Viharas and, and so on. But really, the, the breathing and body, I mean, it's always with us. That's, it should be the easiest thing. You know, we carry it around with us all the time. It's not a thought or imagination. It's a reality, you know. There's always sensation. Why can't people, I, don't, I can't understand, why can't people just use that? They will want something else, you know. No. Uh, what was good for the Buddha is good for us. You know, it's, it's, it's the, the reality, you know. It's... It's the only thing we have. Everybody else can leave you. You know, body and breathing. You know, that's your only reliable friend. Your mind's not reliable because it, you know, but there's always sensations of the body and breathing until you die, and it doesn't require any intellectual imagination about them. They're in your face. You just have to focus there. There's a whole world, a whole separate reality just underneath the skin waiting for you to 
uh, focus on to see their impermanence. It's not that difficult. Uh, and the breathing is the best way. That's why the Buddhists taught the breathing meditation. It's, the, it's our direct access. You know, we, we have the breath with us all the time. But that's why most people, their breathing is so faulty that they can hardly feel it. That's why I, in my own practice, and what I recommend is to do deep, slow breathing. Learn how to develop deep, slow breathing because it's easier to stay focused when you're taking, controlling the breath and taking a deeper breath, holding it in for a few seconds to feel the, the subtle sensations of the oxygenating blood and you feel that relaxing contraction of the out breath. And you do that a few times and it instantly calms you down once you kind of get the hang of it. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, sitting in cross-legged position, lotus posture, appears to be the best way to keep my back and neck straight. Keeps me alert and avoids drowsiness well. However, even though knee pain does not bother at the time, I feel the knee pain for a day or two afterwards. Unable, I am unable to decide whether to suffer drowsiness or pains. Please advise. Well, don't start trying to sit in the full lotus immediately. Try first the cross-legged position, just what is called the easy position, where you're you know, your feet is not up on the other leg or so. They're both touching the floor. Or the, the half lotus. You have to kind of find <laughs> the sitting position is like a, a puzzle in our body. We have, we have to kind of find the, the, the right, the way our, our feet are going to fit. Because people have different, their legs are different, right? If you have a skinny leg or a fatter leg or you have some other kind of problems, uh, you know, uh, you have to kind of experiment for yourself and uh, find a way they're going to fit together. The important thing is keeping the the rear end elevated at least two or three inches higher than your knees. That's the key to meditation. Uh, whether you're sitting in a, a lotus position, half lotus position, or the Burmese position, uh, having the that's why we use cushions because that helps you to helps to keep the lower inward curve of the lower spine in its natural position, and it helps you then to uh, helps to support the weight of the upper body, and it helps you to then uh, sit straight uh, and through less pain. Actually, you know, I learned something from my yoga teacher in India. He said, "Never sit down." Don't sit down. Where well, I'm sitting down. You're, si you're sitting down. You sit up. So, you know, okay, so, okay, you, you're seeing this screen, right? You just see. So, so this is, a, you know, sitting up. Now, wh watch what happens when I relax. That's sitting down. Although I'm sitting on a chair, I'm sitting down. Don't sit down, sit up. <laughs> so sitting up means uh, having a, like a rocket ship starting to take off from the launch pad, right? So that upward kind of momentum, I think it's called a centripetal force. So, you know, that's what you can be aware of when you, when you first sit to meditate. You should pay attention to that. But most people can't sit like that long because the muscles of the back are not strong enough, they haven't been exercised properly to do that. But once you do some back stretches and spinal exercises, strengthen the muscles of the back, you'll be able to keep the body sitting straighter for a longer period of time without much pain. And that is when you overcome drowsiness. Drowsiness is when you start to slouch down like this. Uh, so that's what we have to, that's why I always teach yoga, right? I mean, I, my retreats and even before every time we sit before we do a few you know the point is to try to you know get you to see the, the beneficial of it how it helps your meditation 
not only in sitting with less pain and more alert, but also uh, to feel the sensations because it, you feel subtle sensations when, when the when the energy is flow, flowing more. Um, so anyway, uh, don't force the sitting posture where you're going to have a painful legs for the next couple of days. You got to slowly build up to it. You know, you have to build up the muscles and the bones have to kind of uh, find their groove, you know, and uh, they, they get used to that. So that, uh, you know, you could be able to sit longer and longer without <clears throat> that kind of lingering pain sort of for the first minute or two you might you know to slowly uncross your legs and but uh you know usually that will go away within a, a minute or two so don't force uh, you know the, the sitting in the lotus because you can kind of damage yourself uh, that way When this move, detached eye from the body happens, is there a next step? Should I try to maintain it? I meant the movie. Well, there's a process involved in meditation. In the beginning, there's the eye that's trying to meditate. So you're trying to sit in a posture, you're trying to sit up straight. You're trying to let go of your thoughts. So there's the you know, attachment both to the eye and the body. Oh, this darn body. Oh, me, I can't, uh, I can't do this. You know, so there's attachment to both the, the body and the eye. But as you develop the concentration, then you're able to just sort of watch uh, the body more without the... But the, but the, uh, the, the sense of eye is still there. So you can detach from the body. And the body is just, okay, there's this body sitting there. But then in the mind there's, oh, I'm, I'm a good meditator now. I reached some deeper level. Oh, this is cool. Yeah, right. I like this. So the eye is still there. So the, what the next move is, once you've separated the eye from the body, then you have to let the eye dissolve too. Right? That's the next step. People are always asking, what's the next step in meditation? There's always another step until you've reached the dissolution and cessation of conditioned consciousness. But so first you detach from the body because that's easiest to do. And then you detach from the mind. You have to detach from your thoughts, your anger, your sadness, uh, your, your memories. You, you have to see those in the same way as you saw in the body. And then even at the, after you've detached from your thoughts, the last thing that's still there will be the eye. And that's the hardest thing to let go, the subtle eye consciousness. But then that has to, you have to then contemplate that is also, you know, the anatta is just an illusion. And then eventually that will uh, dissolve, they give the simile of a, like an Alka-Seltzer tablet dropped in water, you know, physically you know, and that, that center core of the tablet gets smaller and smaller and smaller until the very end and the last little bubbles coming off that tablet cease. Ah, that's the dissolution of the self. That's, that's the end, uh, you might say. So anyway, those are the, those are the, the stages you go through, detachment from the body, then detachment from your, your uh, uh, memories, your emotions, your ideas, uh, your opinions and judgments and everything else. And then finally, the, the dissolution of the I. So that's the next step. Yes, and then you try to maintain those. That's the way you go to the next step is by maintaining the detachment to the body uh, because so much of our thoughts are connected with the body that by maintaining that detachment and also what is going through the senses, like some sounds and so on, 
And then it'll be much easier to detach from your thoughts. When you can detach from the actual body, then it'll be easier to de detach from your thoughts. So that the longer you can hold that, uh, you know, detachment to the uh, material aggregate and so on, and uh, stop reacting, you know, or scratching an itch or worrying about pains and so on. Then the same with the thoughts. Then the, the various kind of painful thoughts will, that same detachment will then be transferred to the, to the thoughts. And you hold that long enough, and the ego is connected to the thoughts. So when the thoughts disappear, then the self, uh, it has nothing to hold on to. So it also... Uh, disappears. But our, our body and our thoughts are what the food in the sense stimulations are the food for the ego consciousness. So you have to with, gradually withdraw the food. You have to starve the ego. Right? People are talking about starving the body, you know, that diet. Put a diet on your mind. You know, <laughs> that means especially the, the negative uh, thoughts and the other useless types of thoughts. Uh, okay. Um, next question. After the morning sitting meditation, I find that my mind can remain more focused throughout the day on my work and I'm able to maintain a certain level of equanimity. Is this the rapture and pleasure that the Buddha taught in the first jhana? Thank you so much. Well, anyway, is this the rapture and pleasure in, in the first jhana? Uh, during your meditation, probably you're experiencing the rapture and pleasure of maybe the first jhana, but when you come out and you're doing work, I wouldn't say it's the same quality of rapture and a pleasure. It's more of just a, a, a kind of an equanimity. So, uh, but you know, for the ordinary person, that would be a pleasurable state because the ordinary person is get so easily upset and dragged into all kind of useless stuff. So, if you're able to maintain a more mellow, uh, consistent, uh, mellow uh, mindfulness and equanimity, it's going to be a very peaceful and enjoyable thing, but I wouldn't call that a rapture and pleasure of the first jhana. Uh, but it, it is a kind of a, you know, a, a happiness. Next question, if we are just the five aggregates, or a collection of the aggregates, the physical world is made up of the four elements. What's the difference between us and the inanimate material like minerals? Yeah. What is the life force? Yeah, it's consciousness. It's consciousness that distinguishes us from, you know, especially the ego consciousness. But, you know, consciousness has evolved since the beginning of creation and so on. And it's evolved. So, as we've mentioned before, even trees and inanimate things may have a very rudimentary kind of uh, consciousness. It's certainly not the kind of consciousness that we have as human beings. Or the consciousness of an ant is not as developed as the consciousness of a, of a dog or of an ape, let's say. You know, all these are evolve, evolvements uh, of consciousness from uh, you know, lower forms of life up to what are called the higher forms of life, but it, it, higher in terms of our, the development of the mind and consciousness and its, uh, and its ability to think and reason and, and other things like that. Um, so, if so, what is consciousness? Again, what is consciousness? That's probably the most uh, difficult thing in, in the universe to... <laughs> you know, adequately describe or, you know, like where it came from and, and so on. It's, uh, but it's the knowing faculty. And, and you know, it, oftentimes we may refer to it as the, the life force. Uh, and uh, 
you know, it's it's that electrical energy that of the universe, uh, the creative uh, uh, power, and how where it came from. That's even the Buddha never said. There's no one point in time when all this uh, started. So. Um, but when you reach deeper levels of concentration, you will directly experience for yourself so many different nuances of consciousness and the transformation of consciousness. Now, consciousness has evolved outwardly, so to speak, and meditation is the in uh, the going back in to the one. So. Consciousness started from the one and went into the many billions of different uh, things. And so through meditation, you limit the minds going after so many objects and you come back to that state of oneness. You might say of the original, what they call original mind or pure awareness and, and so on. But, you know, it's a definite experience that you, you will, uh, you know, you will experience when you reach, you know, samadhi and also of the, of the wisdom. Consciousness is not respiration breathing. We're, we become uh, conscious of respiration because it's a movement of the air element and it's a part of the material aggregate. <clears throat> but the, the life force comes in, according to yoga, the, when we breathe, that that consciousness of prana or life force comes in along with oxygen and other things like that. And that's what, you know, is the, sort of the electrical energy that, uh, you know, keeps the body uh, alive. And when the body can no longer hold that, then the consciousness escapes, you know, has to find another vehicle that can support the consciousness in, in another uh, life. Uh, yeah, I think this is the last question. Oh. When the mind started to calm down, my worldly problems at work show up. I'm able to see, and I'm able to see how to solve them. Then I tend to get carried away. How can one stop from reacting to them? Actually, it's true. You know, when you meditate, a lot of good ideas come into your mind. Even myself, sometimes I'm, you know, doing a work project in meditation. Sometimes a great idea will come into the mind about the way I had to solve a problem that I was maybe had been thinking about. Before. I use that. Okay. Well, so what? Take a few minutes out of meditation, solve a problem, go back to your meditation. Uh, so, but it's true because in our normal state, we try to figure out a problem, but we're in a distracted state anyway, and we're trying to figure out a problem from already a distracted state. So it's difficult to find solutions to the problem. The mind just gets confused, the doubts come. But when the mind is calm, you know, and not so many distractions and hindrances, then that the, the, the clarity comes uh, and, and, and the, the ability to answers to questions come up kind of automatically and you can go with them. A lot of time they're, they're you know, they're valid and uh, that doesn't mean all the time that they're going to be exactly true, but still, uh, you, you, you know, you can work out like maybe you're having a relationship problem in, in meditation. You, you come to the conclusion that, oh, yes, I thought it wasn't my fault, but actually I see now it, it was my fault. Okay, let me go apologize. Okay, so that's like a simple, you know, an answer, an insight. That's why it's called insight meditation, because these insights arise. Even sometimes when you're not trying to meditate, just when the mind is calm enough, uh, you know, it'll come up by itself often. Uh, but of course, if you get carried away by them, you can get carried away by them. But, uh, uh, you know, you have to understand what the process is and then, 
learn how to then drop it and not, you know, get it curious. Otherwise, your, your meditation period will be, the whole thing will just be preoccupied with these kind of various uh, thoughts. But it is true that you, you know, some good solutions to problems that can come through meditation. And it is valid. But that itself is not meditation, but this is the, some of the results and benefits that can become from meditation. Even mundane benefits, like you know, learning how to figure out a problem better, right? Because we have to live in the world, right? We have to get along with people. Uh, we have to do things. But there's a time to do those things and there's a time when to let that go and to uh, go deeper. Okay, friends, so uh, I think that looks like that's the end of uh, the, those questions. So it's already almost uh, three o'clock. So <clears throat> we're going to take a short break and uh, to use the restroom and drink some water and, uh, and then we'll come back. We'll do uh, some, uh, you know, some few yoga, stretches, some exercise, and then the meditation. Okay? So come back and see you back in a few stretches before starting our meditation. Just try to stand straight, but relax. Initially, just feel your feet pressing the floor. Feel that weight of the body pressing the feet and the floor. What a prominent sensation. Easy to feel. Feel your arms and hands hanging at the side. Relax the shoulders. Feel that weight of the arms hanging from the shoulders. Feel where the hands touch the side of your legs. Feel your head balanced on top of the neck. And then begin some deep, slow breathing. Try to take three or four seconds to breathe in, drawing the air from the lower Abdominal area up through the rib cage into the upper chest. Feel that expansion of the upper chest. Hold the air in the lungs for three or four seconds if you can. Allow the oxygen to get into the bloodstream and feel the relaxing contraction of the out breath. Take a couple more deep, slow breaths like that as we do all the yoga exercises with that same kind of breathing. Shouldn't strain too hard with the breathing, although it does take some extra effort to breathe in deeply and hold the air in if you haven't done it before. Now the next in breath, raise the arms over the head, interlock the fingers, turn the palms up, straighten the arms, stretch the head back, bend backward a little bit, 
not too much. In the out breath, turn the palms down, touch the top of the head. Again, in breath, palms up, straighten the arms, stretch the head back, stretch upwards, feel all the sensation. Out breath, touch the top of the head. Again, in breath. This time, hold that upward stretch longer. Try to bend back a little more. Release the fingers, the out breath, arms back to the sides. Just feel all the sensations. Gently close the eyes. Try to feel the vibrations under the skin. If you can't feel that, feel the feet pressing the floor. Earth element hardness. The feet pressing the floor. If you can't feel that, just remember standing. 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 Then next, on the in-breath, push up on the toes and raise the arms over the head, facing the palms toward each other about six inches apart, and stretch up. Out-breath, back down, feet to the floor, arms to the side. Use the breathing to help lift and lower the body. Breathing in, like blowing up a helium balloon, the body raises up. Stretch. Out. Once more, in. As we feel the sensations in your hands and fingers, because of raising the arms up and down, it gets the life force and blood moving up and down, creating lots of sensations, pulsations, very pleasant sensations, like the sensation of the PT of the first jhana whole body is kind of vibrating like that. And it's very easy to keep the mind centered inside. It's the parallel universe of the inner body. Next, we'll do side bending. On the in-breath, raise both arms up. You keep your fingers and arms straight. Keep your biceps close to your head. On the out-breath, bend over your right side as far as you comfortably can. You keep the arms parallel to each other. Feel the stretch in the side. 
In breath, lift up. Then the other side, out breath. In. Then to the right, out breath. In, out. And once more to each side, out breath. Breath, lower the arms. Relax, keep the attention in the body. Just feel the hands and fingers. It's probably where you feel the most sensation in the whole body is in the hands and fingers or in the feet or in the face. Remember standing, standing, that's a perception, the standing body is a perception. Even if you can think about I or me, that's also a perception, perceiving the ego. Okay, one last exercise, the head turning. On the in-breath, turn the head to the right as far as you comfortably can. Also turn your eyes to the right. Look at a spot on the wall somewhere to the right or behind you. Keep tension on the twist. The out-breath all the way back to the left. Just concentrate into the neck vertebrae. Try to look over your left shoulder. Turn the eyes to the left. In breath to the right. Out breath left. In breath, right. Out breath, left. And the in breath, let the head stop in the center. I feel the whole body. Whole body standing awareness. See if you can just feel sensations from the feet, the hands, chest, the head, all at one time. You should be able to kind of just Feel all those sensations kind of merged together, giving the perception of a standing body. It was
was only the feet, then you wouldn't have the idea of a standing body because you can, the unconscious mind, it feels sensations from all the different places. It weaves the picture of a standing body, perception and consciousness. The feelings are there, the earth vibrations are there, all the five aggregates are there. Okay, friends, let's, uh, let's come back to our seats for the meditation, sitting meditation. You already were just doing standing meditation, movement meditation. When you practice awareness, everything is meditation. Only when you try to focus on a single object, then it becomes a concentration. Meditation takes more effort. Doesn't take much effort to be aware. Take a sip of water if you have a water bottle handy. is to try to remember some of the things that I was mentioning uh, about the meditation practice. And, uh, I'm going to turn off my video so you don't want to be looking at me watching me meditate or watch yourself meditating. So just get comfortable in the seat. Try to keep the back the head in a straight line. First of all, just bring your attention down to feel where your buttocks press the seat. Just feel that hundred or more pounds of flesh and bones pressing down on the buttocks. And within that is not one feeling, try to notice many different little sensations in the left buttock, the right buttock, maybe the anus. The sitting bones. The earth vibration, that feeling of something being solid or hard, material aggregate. Now move the attention to feel the hands and fingers, where the hands and fingers touch together, or if they're touching the legs. If you can tune back into the subtle pulsation, the sensations in the fingers you had during the yoga exercise. And the cellular vibration. Also the earth element of one hand pressing the earth element of the other hand. We've got sensations there, feelings, perception, my hands, any thoughts about it? I am meditating consciousness. All the five aggregates are right there in the feeling of the hand.
Now gently lift the back and the spine upwards. Imagine, in other words, sit up instead of sitting down. Imagine some space between the spinal vertebrae so that oxygen and blood can, the blood can circulate. Electrical energy can circulate freely to the nervous system. Try to feel the natural inward curve of the lower spine. Understand how that supports the weight of the upper body. That inward curve bulges back outwards and there's nothing to support the body. And you'll sit down, the gravity will pull you down. Then you get lower lumbar pain. You go half asleep. So always sit up. Whenever you notice in the body slouching, you can always straighten up one more cent centimeter, one more fraction of an inch. And feel the head balanced on top of the neck, like balancing a soccer ball on top of a broomstick handle. Keeping the chin level to the floor. And feel your face, and feel some different sensations on your face, the skin stretched over the skull. A little prickling sensation. Feel where the lips touch together, upper lip touches the lower lip. Feel inside the mouth, the tongue, the soft flesh of the tongue, laying against the hard bone of the teeth, the gum. Try to notice different sensations. The mind's natural ability just to watch and observe things. Now take a few deep, slow breaths to try to feel the air moving through the nostrils. After breathing in, hold the air in the lungs a few seconds to feel that pause and try to feel the sensations of holding the air in the lungs. It's the present moment awareness. It's impossible to think about anything else. It takes all of your concentration to hold the air in the lungs. And letting the air out, feel that relaxing contraction of the out breath. You got to feel some sensations in the nostrils as the air is moving in and out. Out breath, discontinue the deep breathing. Just feel the eyes and the sockets and the eyelids stretched over the eyeballs.
might see some color or light or some patterns or maybe just darkness. The point behind the eye is also a natural kind of concentration point. It's easy to hold the attention there. Because we like to see. So from that point behind the eyes, you can almost see the outline of the sitting body. From that point behind the eyes, you kind of feel the outline of the sitting body, feet underneath, hands and arms to the sides, in the middle, clothing touching the skin on different places. The head balanced on top. Sensation of the lips, the facial skin, nose. Just like a photograph or a video. The mind is taking a video of the sitting body, inner body, the sitting, 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 just feel that organic aliveness of the sitting body. Try to make that your primary focus of concentrated awareness. You're not concentrated on one tiny point, but on the sitting posture. And then again, begin some deep, slow breathing to feel the expanding and contracting sensations moving through the sitting posture. And after breathing in, hold the air in the lungs for a few seconds. It's impossible to think while you're holding the air in the lungs. Takes all of your attention and feel the relaxing contractions of the out breath and cultivate this basic mindfulness. Breathing in, letting go of the past and future. Breathing out, sitting here and now. Breathing in, letting go of the past and future. Breathing out, sitting here and now. We're going to try to count the breaths from one to ten to gain a more precise concentration. Try to continue to take some slightly deeper breaths to help hold your concentration. And with the next expanding in breath, mentally count to one. Holding in the breath one or two seconds. With the contracting out breath, also count one. And 
the next expanding in breath to out breath to in breath three out breath three in breath four out breath four in breath five out breath five in breath six out breath six in breath seven Out breath seven. In breath eight. Out breath eight. In breath nine. Out breath nine. In breath ten. Out breath ten and discontinue the counting, discontinue any controlling of the breath. Just stay with that feeling of centeredness in the body. So you feel that silent inner outline of the body. Just let the breathing return to its own uncontrolled rhythm. Continue to feel it, feel the lesser or shorter breaths. Just knowing when the breath is coming in. Knowing when the breath is going out. The knowing is the consciousness, the awareness. Feel the brief pauses between the breaths. So before you are breathing in long breaths, now the body is breathing in shorter breaths. Each breath is different.
Just keep the attention on feeling the expanding and contracting sensations of the abdomen, rib cage, your chest. And what you feel is actually a, mostly the clothing rubbing against the skin of the belly, the rib cage, or the chest as it expands and contracts, causing friction, which is sensation which attracts the consciousness, the perception of I am breathing. Just breathing in, sitting, breathing out, just remember that much it's not much to remember it's the present moment of this body the here and now of the breathing body through whole world Feeling the different sensations of it. At the end of the out breath, feel that contact with the floor, the buttocks, or feet. You just feel the outline of the body. There are two bodies, the body of breathing is the expanding in breath and the pause, the contracting out breath and the pause. It's called the body of breath. It's occurring within the larger body. It's called mindfulness, the body in the body. happening simultaneously. It's called organic oneness. Breathing in, sitting. Breathing out, sitting. Just noticing how each breath is different. Sometimes longer, sometimes shorter. Sometimes it's an easy breath. Sometimes a difficult breath. Sometimes the pauses are very short. Other times the pauses between the breaths might be longer. It's like a scientist looking down into the microscope to notice subtler details. this breathing body.
at the same time be alert for thoughts trying to sneak in or drowsiness. If you get caught up in thinking, know it is thinking, thinking. Gently let go of the thoughts. Just coming back to the breathing body. Breathing in, sitting. Breathing out. Sitting, breath by breath, moment by moment. The natural present moment, body centered awareness. When you can watch the body sitting and breathing, then you'll be able to watch the mind thinking, agitating, with that same detachment. If you catch yourself totally lost in thoughts, recognize it as lost, lost. Find the body sitting on the floor. Take a couple of deep, slow breaths. Reel the mind back into the body. Get it regrounded, centered. Breathing in, sitting. Breathing out, sitting. It's the ongoing connection to the eternal now, to the present moment. It's breathing body.
mind is calm enough to try to identify the five aggregates. This is material form, four elemental vibrations. This is feeling pleasant, painful, and neutral. It's perception, mental labels, names of objects. It's the volitional formations, urging or wanting to move or think or do. This is consciousness. I mean mine. Take a few deep, slow breaths from time to time. Keep the system charged up with oxygen to avoid spacing out. Just noticing subtler, finer details, sensations in the body. Noticing subtler thoughts, urges moving through the back of the mind. It's 
allow the awareness to gradually expand, to notice more and more sensations, sounds, thoughts arising and vanishing. Without clinging, without rejecting. Even pains are just feeling, just water bubbles of feeling. They don't have much meaning unless you personally identify with them. That's my pain, pain in my knee, neck. Watching the body with detachment. The body is just sitting there. The first stage of meditation. And you can watch the body sitting there and all the sensations going through it. You can watch the mind's mental reactions with the same detachment. habitual repetitions of mental reactions, thoughts, memories. And you can detach from them and the last thing left is thought of I, me, the good meditator, or the bad meditator. It's the last frontier. The last silver thread holding the mind to this conditioned world of duality. Inside, outside, me and other.
what perception arises in the mind with that sound. Sambhi Sankara Anichati Sambhi Sankara Dukati Sambhi Dhamma Anatati Yada Panyaya Pasati Atene Bindati Dukhi Esa Mago Visudhya Dukkha Pata Chani Dukkha Bhaya Pata Chani Bhaya Sokha Pata Chani Sokha Hon tu sabbe e panino. All conditioned things, the five aggregates of this body, mind, and world are impermanent. They're always changing, so they arise and vanish. And all impermanent things, when tightly clung to with ignorance, bring stress and suffering. And all the conditioned dhammas, as well as the unconditioned, even pure awareness is without any owner or controller. It's not self. When one understands these three characteristics with the eye of wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with suffering. This is the path to purity, to freedom. And may the suffering be free from suffering. May the fear struck be free from fear. May the grieving be free from grief. In this way may all beings live with mindfulness and wisdom. And thus spoke the Buddha. Now, friends, let's spend the last couple of minutes of the meditation sending out thoughts of metta vibrations, best wishes, friendliness to all beings, including our own body and mind. So now, again, take some deep, slow breaths, and after breathing in, hold the air and to the lungs and imagine that as the metta, that oxygen going out to bathe all the cells and tissues of the body with life healing, relaxing energy. Just imagine that as sending metta to your own body and mind. May the cells of the body and mind be happy. And on the out breath, feel that relaxation into the present moment with the long out breath. Just thinking along these lines to yourself, may I be well, peaceful and wise. May I be free from greed, hatred, fear and ignorance <clears throat> and all the pains and sufferings that come about from such unskillful thoughts, speech, and actions. May I have the patience, strength, mindfulness, and wisdom 
defeat and overcome all difficulties in life. May I be able to continue to deepen my understanding of the Dhamma and the practice of meditation to free the mind from confusion and suffering. May I be well, peaceful, and wise. In the same way, I try to keep taking some deep, slow breaths especially with each out breath, just imagine these same type of metta thoughts and vibrations going outward into the world, especially if you know anybody who's ill or has having problems in your family or friends and so on. And I'd like it especially to send some metta thoughts to our dear friend Prashant and his mother who is now in hospice care waiting for the inevitable outcome, just wishing these metta thoughts to soothe their worries, anxieties, fears about the unknown, wishing them to have a peaceful transition. Just with each out breath, just imagine these vibrations entering into their bodies and minds, relaxing their fears and worries and all other beings as well, all the common ordinary folks out there that are suffering from this COVID diseases and other worries associated with that, their jobs and other things. Just wish that this Dhamma could help, you know, ease their minds and worries about all these things, understanding that you know, there's little we can do to control it except try to create the right conditions. Anyway, just with each out breath, just imagine these vibrations going out to surround the whole earth, and all the living beings on earth, even beyond. Just with each out breath, like waves of metta going further and further out to surround the whole earth and world with the idea that may all living beings be well, peaceful and wise. May all living beings be free from excessive attachment, greed, hatred, fear and ignorance. May all beings have the patience, strength, mindfulness and wisdom to meet and overcome all difficulties in life. May all beings have the opportunity to hear the teachings of the Dhamma, learn and practice meditation, to help free their minds from confusion, fear, and suffering. May all beings be able to live peacefully and harmoniously together understanding the ultimate interconnectedness and interdependence of all things. May all beings be well, peaceful and wise. May all beings be well, peaceful and wise. Just like a mantra reverberating throughout space. Well, peaceful and wise. Now slowly place your hands at the edge of your knees. 
Take one more deep breath as you're breathing in, stretch the head backwards, and pull the hands against the knees to help arch your back and spine. Hold it a few moments. Feel the sensation. And lift the head up and on an out breath, press the chin to the top of the chest and stretch the neck vertebra. And lift the chin up level to the floor on the in breath. And relax on the out breath. And put a smile on your face. Okay, friends. So I hope you're able, we're able to follow that uh, meditation.